Hello and welcome everybody. I'm sorry we're just a few minutes late. My name is Hayatun Silam. I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering and on behalf of the Academy I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's Critical Conversation. Over the course of our Critical Conversation series I've had the good fortune to have been joined by some exceptional speakers to explore and debate issues of critical importance to the global engineering community and indeed to wider society. In our last critical conversation in September, we were looking at the global problem of open burning of waste. This practice, particularly in lower and middle income countries, is a widely used but hugely unsafe way of dealing with the vast quantities of consumer goods and other engineered products and structures discarded at what is considered the end of their useful life. And in addition to the risk to people's lives and to their health, open burning of waste poses acute risks for our climate and environment. And we're continuing the sustainability theme today with our discussion on the right to repair. And we're going to be asking, how can we help to reduce the amount of global waste and its impact? How can we move away from built-in obsolescence in product design? And what action can be taken to prolong the life of engineered, engineered products and facilitate their reuse? We've got two brilliant speakers to explore these questions with, and I'm very pleased to be joined this evening by Professor Mark Miodovnik, Fellow of the Academy and Professor of Materials and Society at University College London and Director of the UCL Institute of Making. And also Dr. Amrit Chandan, an entrepreneur and CEO of Acceleron, a company that Amrit co-founded that's designing advanced lithium batteries for the circular economy. You're going to get the chance to meet them both in a minute, but first, I'm sure you all know, on the 16th of October, it is International Repair Day. We live in a world of great convenience from the perspective of the consumer in a country like the UK. But there is a dark side to our consumption habits. Fast fashion, disposable electronics, appliances with built-in obsolescence are all contributing to a depletion of our planet's finite resources and generating really problematic amounts of waste. Some of you may have seen the news article today referring to the fact that the electronic and electrical waste that we will discard in 2021 will weigh more than 57 million tonnes, which is heavier than the Great Wall of China, the planet's heaviest artificial object. And I was particularly shocked to learn that the UK is actually the second largest producer of electronic waste globally, second only to Norway. We produce the equivalent of 24 kilos of electronic waste per person per year. Now within that waste, our whole myriad gadgets and appliances, each of which has its impact on our environment, from the energy and resources that we need to make it, to the waste and emissions produced in its manufacture, and then of course the issue of how its physical existence is handled once it's discarded and becomes part of the waste stream. There are some encouraging signs that the seriousness of this global challenge is starting to be acknowledged and addressed. For instance, UK and EU right to repair legislation is set to change the rights of citizens to access and carry out repairs on some household appliances. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But as engineers and global citizens, we need to understand more about what lies behind the current unsustainable trends in consumerism and design and what we can do to reverse them. So today's conversation will explore how we got into such a state of disrepair and what we can do about it. And we have two excellent guests to guide us through the topic. So Professor Mark Miodovnik, as I said earlier, is a fellow of the Academy. He's also a broadcaster and a writer on science and engineering. Following a PhD in turbine jet engine alloys from Oxford University, he's worked as a materials scientist in the US, in Ireland and the UK. And for more than 20 years, he's championed materials research that links the arts and humanities to medicine, engineering and material science. This culminated in the establishment of the University College London Institute of Making, where he's a director and runs a research programme. His current research interests are animate materials, innovative manufacturing and designing out waste. He's a self-confessed tinkerer and describes himself as mad keen on fixing things, which is a very technical term, I think. Also joining me is Dr. Amrit Chandan, who's the co-founder and CEO of Acceleron. Amrit's an entrepreneur and is interested in projects which address the global climate, resource and poverty challenges that we face today. He holds a PhD in fuel cell technology and worked in the low carbon vehicle space for several years. He co-founded Acceleron in 2016, which designs advanced lithium batteries for the circular economy, and they've already raised over £5 million in private funding. He's received several accolades, including being named in the prestigious Forbes 30 Under 30 list, and was awarded the Hawley Award for Engineering Innovation by HRH Princess Royal on behalf of the Worshipful Company of Engineers. 
Amrit has recently joined our Engineering X Safer End of Engineered Life program as a champion and has been a member of our Enterprise Hub at the Academy. So I'm going to kick off the discussion with our brilliant speakers with a little bit of a chat, but then we're then going to move on to audience questions. So please do pop any questions that occur to you while we're having our chat into the chat box. And if you want to direct it at Mark or Amrit, please feel free to. And so as soon as we've just kick things off with a bit of discussion, we'll try and get to those questions and get through as many as possible. I'm going to turn to you first, please, Mark. Your BBC Radio 4 series, brilliantly called Dare to Repair, was broadcast earlier in this year. And in it, you looked at the repair of household goods and how we've lost this habit of repairing things and what citizens, retailers, manufacturers can do to change that. So it's based on the premise that we used to repair things more than we do today. What happened? When did we go wrong? When did this change? And why should we care? Yes, well, thank you. Um, so at the, in the 20th century, it's been, it was a, a boom in household goods, which improved people's lives and liberated people, particularly women, actually. So something like the washing machine was absolutely pivotal in, uh, in releasing that burden of having to do daily washing. Uh, dishwashers came along, radios, TVs, and so on. And at first, these were very high-end items. These were expensive things. And, and as, as the kind of manufacturing and engineering community tried to give them to everyone at a price they could all afford, um, so the price came down. And that was innovative manufacturing and supply chains uh, operating at their best. Um, but the problem was, as those things were innovated, like that, they often became much more complicated and harder to repair. So before, when they first came out, they were very high-end things and, and they were designed to be repaired. And if, if something went wrong with them, the, the citizen could repair them or a professional repairer could repair them. And the amount they would charge for that would be small compared to the price of the cost of the item. But as we went through the 20th century, so that differential came down, especially in, in um, uh, nations where they were wealthy, because the, the cost of uh, labor compared to how much it would cost to repair what became parity. So you get to the point in the in the late 20th century where many items, if you if you go to a, a professional repairer or you call them into your home, the cost of the repair is a, a, almost 50% of a buying new. And at that point, um, many citizens will buy new. Um, and, 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 and that basically has got, got worse and worse, that ratio. There are other things that have happened too, um, and, and, and you know, many, many people will, will accuse, um, let's say, smartphone manufacturers um, of, of intentionally building in obsolescence to something like a smartphone by the act of, for instance, making the battery unreplaceable by the citizen. And that seems very unfair because pretty much all the other things you buy in your life that have batteries have a little bit at the back and you <laughs> open it up and you can change the battery. And that, 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 that seems a right, you know. Um, and that was, that was, in a sense, swept away and... The, the smartphone manufacturers will say, well, people bought into it. We, we offered them that and they wanted it and it makes it slightly smaller and sleeker and more waterproof. And so people wanted it and we gave it to them. But others would say, and I think I would agree with them, that they had a responsibility actually to extend the life of those products, make them uh, last longer. And, and actually they've been actively trying to get you to buy new ones. And, and you see this with software obsolescence. So another way to get you to buy another object is to, is to basically not support the software. And so you have to, in a sense, buy another one. And this has accelerated. And now we are at the point, place we are today where I think most people will agree, most of the things that come into their lives, whether they're an electric toothbrush or an electric shaver or a radio or a kettle, how long do kettle last? I mean, 12 months, if you're lucky, electric kettles. So, so now we're in this apps, as you said, 57 million tons. It's because of this, this comp, you know, this um, uh, the, the, the efficiency in making the stuff, the intention that they basically are not going to be repaired because you can't afford to repair them, and this is a, of course a bias in the, in in the in the minds of the manufacturers, but also it tends to be borne out by citizen behaviour. To be honest, so so I think the manufacturers would say this is what citizens want. They don't want to repair things; they want a new thing, and the, here we are today, and it's it's an environmental disaster. Thank you, Mark. Not the most optimistic note to start on, but it's helpful framing. Could you just tell us a little bit more about those drivers? And, and you and I both use this phrase, built-in obsolescence. 
Can we just unpack it a bit and make sure we're all clear what, what that actually refers to? I mean, built-in obsolescence as a term comes into the, into the English language um, by a guy who's head of uh, General Motors, 1945. And it's, it's an intentional strategy to sell more motor cars by changing the styling every year. And, and, it, 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 and, and actually, they're unashamed about it because they're saying, look, people want this. People, and in fact, dry, if, you, if, you, if people buy new, what it means is it gets better and progress is at stake here. If you hang on to old stuff, progress will never happen. And they've got a point that a lot of, a lot of innovation happens because people buy more and more stuff and, and, as, and as the competition in the marketplace makes things better. But, but actually that built-in obsolescence, i.e. next year won't be as cool as this one, so you better buy another one. That, that's what we mean by the term. But it, it can also mean um, we're actually going to intentionally put components in there that are going to break after a certain time. And this is, this is a fact. Some manufacturers have done this. Or you might put software in there that expires. So it, it can now cover quite a range of activities, some of them essentially mirroring what essentially people want, new things, and, and giving people an excuse to buy a new thing. Uh, and, and some of them more sinister, in my view, which are you know intentionally making things break. Okay, thank you. So that's really helpful and also very important to remind uh, us all of our own role in this process that we're talking about today in getting us to where we don't want to be. Um, Amrit, I'm going to turn to you now and I'd just like you to sort of give me an overview of where you think we are currently. Absolutely, thanks. So I think one of the challenges we face is we've all grown up in a system which is maximising the sort of linear model where we produce, we use and we throw away. And the life cycle of the, of the technology is not considered at all in the production or the, or the end. And it takes a lot of energy to make something and then unmake it. And yes, you can get these closed loop systems, but ultimately they're not very efficient. And as we're finding, we're doing irreparable damage and harm to the environment. Uh, the, the case where sort of Acceleron works is in, is in batteries, where this is really apparent. The, the scale of growth has been huge, especially with the demand for electric vehicles. The batteries are not designed to be maintained or repaired over time because they're produced using the same methods that are just scaled up from consumer electronics. So permanent methods like spot, spot welding and glues are used to assemble these complex electronic pieces of, of equipment. And because they can't be maintained, it's kind of like using the car analogy, we've riveted on the tires onto the car and tires are not designed to last as long as a car will they're designed to be replaced. And we haven't done this with, with lithium batteries. So it's, it's really important that we consider every stage of a product or a piece of equipment during its life to make sure that we are considering the triple bottom line, that the, the sustainability in there, that it positively impacts the society that within which it operates and the environment as well. If it's, if it's purely about profit and profit driven and not considering the other two, then it's a zero sum game and everything just trends towards, towards zero. It's so critical that we do consider the, the impact this has on the people that are using it and the, the environment as well. And you, and you can see this, it's not really in the public eye, but as products migrate through their life, at some point for many products, they end up in developing regions um, where there's a demand generally for the technology and when they do reach end of life, if they're not easy to take apart, it's left to entrepreneurial individuals who can do themselves lots of damage and do damage to the environment because there is no infrastructure to properly recycle or recover materials. So this is actually, we have to look at this challenge holistically, considering all factors um, and not just sort of the immediacy, uh, the myopic sort of short-term low-cost approach, which is what's been prevalent for a very long time. Brilliant, Amrit. That's, that's really interesting. and. You know, you're a, a good example of somebody who is not seeing themselves as a slave to this linear model of business. Um, you have intentionally uh, chosen to develop a circular business model. Um, so how much is this about innovators and manufacturers and entrepreneurs choosing to do that, choosing to embed circularity in the way that they build their businesses? And how much do you need help from the government and from the consumer to make your businesses viable? So it's a really good question. Uh, I think there's a, there's a massive amount of demand for doing the right thing. And we're seeing that as time goes on. So many of the large corporates are now abandoning brand names, which have no positive value at all, because consumers are more and more environmentally and, and socially aware of what it is they're doing. 
Um, I think that trend is only going to continue. And we're seeing the amount of the world, the coverage of right to repair legislation in some form or another going up every single year. I think it's currently around sort of 75% of the world's population is governed by some form of right to repair. Um, so that legislation, trend, legislative trend is only going to continue. This is the way everything is going. So having, having a circular model is difficult. There's, it's not an easy thing to do, um, but I don't think it's right for us considering how short a timeline we're on to try and avert the climate crisis we have to rely on legislation, which is usually the last thing that changes. The government is not really a forward-looking organization. They're there to stop people from doing the wrong thing as a sort of almost as a matter of last resort. So it's on us as individuals to make that change and to, to be the leaders that we want to be in order to, in order to positively impact the environment we're on. At the end of the day, we're just borrowing the resources of our future generations and it's unkind to them. And we're not talking grandchildren or great-grandchildren. Literally, our children right now will face huge obstacles if we don't change what we're doing. So I just think it's it's it will be massively irresponsible of us to do nothing. Thank you, Amrit. Um, that's very powerful. Now, hold that thought on legislation. I want to come back to that in just one second. But I also want to remind our audience that we're going to move on to your questions very soon. So please do pop them in the chat. We've got a few great ones coming through already. Um, Mark, legislation. There's a lot of fuss about this right to repair legislation. What, what's it all about? What does it mean? So right to repair legislation um, has come into, into force in the EU and in the UK, which covers a limited range of goods and is, is intended to um, increase the duration, the length of time those goods exist in the marketplace and in people's homes, because that has been shortening over time. And we know that that's the best and the, the quickest way to reduce CO2 emissions from, from things like TVs and fridges and, and so on. Because if, they, if you want the utility of cold food in your house, you don't need to keep rebuying a fridge. You, you just want a fridge that will last you 50 years. So that, that, that fridge is repairable at a, at a reasonable cost and that spare parts are available is now an imperative, an, uh, an environmental imperative. And that's what the governments have recognized. And so they want to force, in fact, they are forcing those manufacturers to provide spare parts um, and to make those goods repairable. Um, the other, the other goods that are being are at, in this first in this first um, legislation are, are, are TVs, are washing machines, um, and um, dishwashers. So it's it's not a huge range. Smartphones are not included, um, and you know, but it's likely, as Amrit says, that this is going to increase because. Um, the scope of this legislation is really about trying to get these goods to last longer in our homes, in our hands, and, and not to have them thrown thrown away, um, and not to and not to therefore cause the waste or, or as much waste as they're causing. Great. And just off the back of that, Amrit, I'd like to ask you, how you know, from a manufacturer's perspective, how sympathetic are you to the idea that? The reason companies want to retain control of servicing and repair of their products is because they believe that's the best way to ensure safety and reliability. It's it's a very valid concern, uh, and I empathise entirely. I mean, like I said, we make batteries, and um, with a black battery platform, we the last thing you want is someone digging inside and sort of having a play around. But at the same time, people are people, um, and you you see this with the automobile sector where. You can buy an old car and you can do whatever you want and they're not they're not safe devices there's a risk of explosion there's a risk of all sorts of stuff any kind of energy storage medium has risks with it so you know i think i think there's two sides of the coin i think we need to treat people like adults and actually make sure that they're educated enough to be able to do things but at the same time make sure that the products are are safe or have inbuilt safety features so that if someone does something at least there is a level of protection i think we also need to make sure that you know, there has to be a reasonable point at which liability shifts because the, the last thing any manufacturer wants is someone someone does something with their product, there's a there's something goes wrong, there's a loss of life or, or an injury that happens and then it's their name plastered everywhere that their products are unsafe, which may not be true. You have no idea, no control over what that person would be doing with the product. But there, there has to be some kind of reasonable level at which, you know, again, the responsibility lies with the with the person, and I, I reference again the the car sector. Um, no one blames one of the manufacturers for a, for a, for you know modification that's been done to a car 
that then sort of, you know, there's a horrific accident as a result of it. No one points to the car makers to say, this is your fault. So it, it clearly can be done. Uh, it's just about making sure that we embed it properly at the beginning. Great, Amrit, thank you. I'm going to start bringing in audience questions now. There's got some great ones coming through. Um, so building on what we've just been discussing, Samuel Shannon from UCB has asked, should legislation around manufacturers' responsibilities for product quality also include end of life in their life cycle assessments? So in other words, embedding the cradle to grave mentality in those assessments. Who'd like to take that? Amrit, <laughs> go on then, Mark. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I just want to hear the question again, because it, what, so, so it means that you, to sell that product onto the market, you'd have to publish that data. Is that right? Is well, that the it, question? The question is, should end of life be included in the manufacturer's responsibility for product quality? Because I, I, I see that as really problematic for the manufacturers because how, I mean, we, we'd be talking to the manufacturers today in a round table and many of them don't sell directly to the public anyway. They sell through dealers and they, they lose sight of their products as soon as it goes into the dealership. Uh, and then if they are then, if they are then um, responsible for the end of life of that, they actually don't have a direct well, they don't even know where they, they admitted to they have no idea where these things are. So it would be a wholesale change in the way that many of these manufacturers work. I'm not, I'm not saying that's not a bad thing. And we were, we, I can see many upsides to that, which is you can then continue a relationship with that customer. You can, you can give them advice about repair and maintenance because maintenance is the first line of repair and will extend the life of goods like washing machines, where the first thing to go often is the, is the heat the heater and and um the water heater for instance and and those are often going because they're not maintained properly because of calcification so so i can see lots of really good reasons to do this but i think with the current system in which manufacturing uh, exists within a marketplace um it would be very onerous the manufacturer will push back very hard on that okay thank you and amrit would you agree with that i i think if i if i view the question in a slightly different way i think um that it should be the responsibility of of uh, manufacturer to consider the life cycle and I think we will end up in a place just as you have energy efficiency stickers where you will have a almost you know how circular is this product type of rating on a on a on a, on a product um, and that could really do some interesting things because you know, if, if we get really creative with the way you know value-added tax works or perhaps the other sort of levers that legislation could could come in um, and, and affect it could really sort of tip the scales in the favor of the products which are more circular or have a lower lifetime impact um, but you know there is a there is an onus then on the manufacturer to ensure that they have considered that at the end of life which i think is even if they're not directly responsible there should be that consideration as the first step thank you Amit. well let, let me continue on that that theme um margaret ross from southampton solent has asked how could you encourage purchasers to ask about ease of disassembly in addition to the price and new features so You've talked about, you know, could there be some way of grading the circularity of, the, of, of a product that consumers could use? What, what else would you say we could do to um, encourage purchasers to think more about that long term impact of the product that they're buying? Um, Mark, I'm going to start with you on this. Yeah, I mean, so so what France have done is really interesting and they've moved further ahead than any other country, which is they've made a, you've got to have a repairability score at the point of purchase next to the price of these items. And this has been a big hit in France. It's been going for nine months and people are starting to talk about, oh yeah, well, my washing machine has got a repairability score of nine out of 10. And as soon as you, as I think this is really what's got to happen is that we've really got to get people interested in the end of life, but not just the end of life, but their ability to you know, repair it and, and and, and we can then start, then, then the product can start competing in the marketplace on this basis. But you need information. And I think it's, it's impossible for anyone to, to buy things and know how well it's going to be repaired or possible to repair without this information. So I totally agree with this. I think this is a, a great way forward. Well, I'm going to come to Amrit in just one second. We're going to add in a subsidiary question just to make it even more exciting for you. Um, so Muir McDonald has asked, how about manufacturers making available codes for 3D printed comp components? especially plastic and metal casings. So, Amrit, do you want to cover off those two questions, please? Absolutely, yeah, that's, that's really good questions. Um, and actually something, again, we discussed slightly earlier today in the, in the roundtable. Um, I think just coming to the point of, of you know, that, that change, I think being able to sort of advertise uh, the repairability or the sort of circularity, uh, degree of circularity, is fantastic. And actually, you wouldn't it be a great idea to 
transition away from this is the cost today, but actually this is the cost. This is what it would cost you every year to run this product, um, which then sort of it becomes very much a sort of total cost of ownership as opposed to a capital expenditure type of proposition for, for consumers. And then very easily they can see that actually to repair and have something which considers the end of life could well be cheaper. Now, of course, there's always, you know, there are always, there, there can be reasons why you would want to go for the cheapest option regardless of sort of the repairability. And that's, that's something to be considered. But when it comes to sort of 3D printing of parts, yeah, again, you know, it's, it's a really interesting point. I think if, if manufacturers are comfortable doing that, again, with the understanding that there probably has to be some kind of, some kind of liability waiver uh, on the part of the product, then I don't think there would be an issue with that. Uh, obviously, you know, 3D printers come in a variety of shapes and sizes, um, and they could print to different resolutions. And depending on what you print with, the, the, the quality of the, the sort of printed part may be significantly different than what the manufacturer would recommend. And this is where it gets a bit tricky. But I can certainly see in the future, as, as these technologies become more ubiquitous, that 3D printed parts will be, will be the way of the future for repair and manufacture. Great. Thanks, Amrit. And Mark, what are your thoughts on 3D printed casings? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, so I think when we, we have to really think very kind of innovatively about the fact that we are going to have to transition to a repair economy very fast. And this is this, you know, we should really be exploring this deeply as an engineering community, because this is this there's there's a huge potential here, not not just because it would allow companies, um, well, uh, citizens to repair things themselves when the parts are not available, but it also is is a potential opportunity for the bit for the manufacturers because at the moment they've got to store in warehouses huge numbers of, of spare parts and that costs them money and they they don't really want them there but they have to because that's their responsibility to allow something to be repairable. So if something has a lifespan of 10 years, they've got a warehouse of 10 years worth of spare parts. Now they don't want that. That's not good for anyone. So, so if we could imagine if they redesign their products so that most of the ones that break all the time can be 3D printed. Now, maybe they're more expensive than the parts they're storing in the warehouse, but now you don't have a warehouse to store them. So you, it's win-win. And I think win-win's the way we've got to go. Win-wins where the manufacturer wins and the citizen and the environment win. That's, we've got to identify those and go for them really fast. Okay, that's all very helpful. I'm gonna keep feeding you questions. Um, so there's lots of fantastic questions coming in. So Simon Moore from the University of Cambridge has said, can we legislate that manufacturers must provide spare parts to individuals? And he uses the example of Mercedes-Benz provide parts for historic cars and suggest that Tesla won't do that um, except to approved service partners. Now, I don't want to get into the specifics of different company strategies, um, but what's your view on a, a, you know, a mandate that requires uh, manufacturers to provide spare parts? Um, Amrit? Perhaps we could take it, you know, look at it slightly differently, where we say, you know, maybe the legislation is something along the lines of parts are available for a set period of time after, you know, after uh, the product is released on the market. And then once it's deemed obsolete by the manufacturer, then it becomes freely available and the schematics and everything are there for people to do themselves, as we find with software, where after a number of years, software becomes you know freeware and, and you, anyone can sort of do what they want with it so perhaps that could be one way of approaching this again i think it's really difficult to comment on, on the individual cases because there are many manufacturers out there the original oems will never deal directly with the consumers it really depends on their on their dealer networks um, and you know how they how they're sort of you know, who the who the purchaser is of the products thank you mark I would like to also kind of, I, I agree with Amrit that that's a, that's a, but also I'd like us to consider a, a more, a, um, a, an, a radical solution to this, which is that if you think about why patents came into, into play, it's because you had innovative companies and people, they did the work, the hard work, they poured, brought something to the market, it was immediately copied and they lost out. And in the end, we decided as a society that we could grant a patent, which would give you a monopoly on a certain product or technology for a certain amount of time to reward you for being innovative and basically helping society be better. And then after that, it's expired and everyone has it. You know, along the lines of what Amrit is saying, I feel like when you bring a product onto market, essentially, you, you know, you, you kind of sign a contract with the, with, the, with, with, the, with the country, which is, you know, I'm gonna, you're allowed to sell this and make a profit, but after a certain number of years, you have to make it open source. 
And I, I, it just sounds mad, but actually, you know, we are in a climate emergency. We actually, we need to wholesale redesign almost every product we have in our lives. And something like this, you know, could shake things up and bring emerging innovative companies like Amrit's, you know, give them the boost that we need. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about quite a deep cultural and societal shift here. It's, it's mm-hmm. happening at many layers. And I'd like to talk more about that, but I also want to pivot slightly and look at education skills. So we've got a question from William Santos from ABI Electronics. And he's asking about the need to train technicians and engineers for repair, uh, which is not necessarily the skill set that we have traditionally focused on. But I'd be quite interested in your, I guess, broader thoughts around what we're going to have to do differently in the way that we educate and upskill our engineering and design workforce at all levels. Um, So, Mark, do you want to kick off with that? Yeah, I mean, so so one of the things, I mean, I'm certainly someone who ended up in engineering because um, I was in a household where my dad and my mum repaired stuff and I saw them doing it and it was normal for me. And that's how I started to understand how things worked. And when I went to school, then I was given a whole lot of theory and that was fine too. But I feel like what's happened is that the kind of the, the ratio in people's most people's lives of witnessing repair and understanding objects and engineering by taking them apart and, and mucking about has diminished compared to the theory of how things should work. And this is how we design things. And I just feel that that equation is not doing us any any favors here. We need we need to shift that in schools. And I, I mean, I, I would like morning to be theory and the afternoon practice in, in every topic. <laughs> I, you know, I just think, great, theory is important. I do theory all the time, but it, without practice, it, you don't really, it doesn't embed it in your head and you don't really understand how the world works. So again, I, I think if we had a whole lot of people going through school who really understood how stuff works because they'd taken stuff apart and repaired them. And then, then I think, your their their value set will change because they'll love that stuff like I do because it's interesting and you see you know you see how you know you have a relationship with it that's deep not superficial and isn't that the cultural shift we need I I wouldn't argue with you Mark but I would also say that you know you are at one of the world's leading universities for engineering so are you confident that your students in engineering and related areas are getting the education that they need to really embed circularity into the way that they go about being engineers when they finally hit the real world. Well, we've definitely moved in that direction a lot, a lot in the last few years. So now we've invested in a five-story building, which is just dedicated to the making and manufacturing. So all our students get to experience the MEC space. Um, we, um, all of our design work includes environmental audit and design for repair. So I wouldn't say we're perfect in any way. We're shifting in that direction. I think all all engineering courses really, the onus is to do this and to do it fast and to keep doing this. I agree. I, I, you know, this, is, this is really is the way forward. And Amrit, I'd love to get your thoughts too. And also to think a little bit about the people who are already out there in our workforce um, and how we're going to support companies to upskill and reskill their employees and to even know where to where to find the training to support uh, the sorts of skills we're going to need for a more circular economy. Yeah, again, such a such a good question, and um, I, I'm going to draw on on experience of some of the stuff we're doing at Acceleron to help answer this. So, one of the challenges we 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 operate within developing regions, and one of the challenges you have within developing regions is that the infrastructure to service and maintain these complex electronic goods just doesn't really exist, um, and so. There's a there's a, a lot a lot of batteries and a lot of e waste accumulating in in these parts of the world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where solar has taken off hugely um, because the, the grid infrastructure isn't so well developed. And so one of the things that we've been working on, because we're so interested in the circular economy economy model, in an ideal world we wouldn't have to build the infrastructure as well, but to an extent we have to demonstrate the infrastructure around sort of supporting a circular model. And so we've been developing this sort of almost, you know, repurposing facility that can be sort of deployed anywhere in the world. So just imagine like a container that has all the testing, the training, the, the sort of all the parts needed to be able to repair, repair solar lamps, solar home systems, batteries within these sort of developing regions. And so we're, we're embarking on a couple of programs at the moment. Um, one in particular I'm really excited about, which is actually we're deploying one of these facilities 
within a uh, within a migrant camp in Uganda to be able to to solve the the growing e waste challenge they have, re repurpose and repair solar lamps and also the batteries there, training local people to be able to repurpose their own their own waste and, and actually make a living as well. And being able to sort of demonstrate you can do that with complex goods with relatively untrained people is, is something we, we're really looking forward to demonstrate in the in the coming months. Can I, yeah. Nathan, can I come back as well? Because I think it's quite this topic is really deep in the sense that I think at all levels of society we can we can make a difference. And we need a we need a wholesale, you know, we need a movement, a, a zeitgeisty moment in the same way that we had for plastic waste. Um, we need that for this. And I think every it's, it really affects everyone. And so, you know, there's all these repair cafes and repair workshops that are being rolled out. And they people are really, it's not just that they get to repair their, you know, broken toasters and TVs and things, but they are, they, 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 it's a place to interact. And I think high streets have been denuded of places to interact other than to buy things, other than to have coffee. Um, and I think we can, you know, again, we can do something radical in the high street by reintroducing repair and making, um, not, not, not just for the sake of it, but because actually this is gonna have a huge environmental benefit, but also a, a personal benefit. You know, people really themselves are transformed by being part of these communities. And I really think we shouldn't underestimate the power of that. Um, and I, I think that then you have, what you have also at the moment is professional repairers are beginning, the average age in the UK is going, is getting, older and older so they're plus 50 now the average age it's very hard to recruit but but why why is that and it's not just pay although pay is an issue it's 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 that it's not deemed to be you know a, a career of note right but but actually it from, from what we've been saying so far you know if you look ahead you know the repairers of the future are the ones that are going to really be keeping us on track to getting to net zero and and these are these people professional repairs are heroes. I mean, I think we really need to big up the status of the people who are taking us to net zero because every, you know, otherwise <laughs> this is, we're in real trouble. And just to add to that as well, um, I think as we transition to net zero, there is more and more, more and more being put into electronics and electric based systems. And they are not simple things to, to repair in the same way that perhaps a car engine was up to sort of recent times. And so there, there is a looming crisis in infrastructure to actually support even the electric vehicles that are coming out on the road because the skills to actually repair and remanufacture those isn't there. And there is no solution at the moment. The, the solution for dealing with when something goes wrong with the electric vehicle is that batteries are stockpiled in warehouses until the automakers are able to figure out a solution. Uh, and so there needs to be a level of training, even of the existing you know, mechanics and local MOT garages to be able to deal with the more, more and more complex nature that we're seeing and actually be able to do repairs without it having to go back to the manufacturer. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a massively important point. And actually, as, I, as you were talking earlier, Amrit, about um, the experience in migrant camps, and I, I was thinking that one of the challenges that we have in, in a country like the UK is we are most of the time really ignorant of this global supply chain and set of processes and waste streams that enable us to have the lifestyle we have. We don't have a very immediate relationship with the engineered products and service or products and goods that we use. Um, and maybe I am one of these terrible optimists that's always looking for the silver lining, but I just want to, to ask whether you, know, you would agree that the experience of the pandemic has perhaps given us all a bit more of a sense of being rooted in something more local and, and, and to think afresh about what our lifestyles represent. And is that something that we can harness um, in order to try to create more energy around circular ways of life, perhaps not necessarily just at a national level, but rooted in local communities? I mean, Mark, this is a, sort of building what you were saying. Uh, am I being wildly optimistic? Or do you think there's something in that? <laughs> Look, it's in our hands. That's the thing. Like we, 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 we worry about global climate change, rightly so. But, you know, all of the consumption that is in our lives is, is the thing that's driving us there. And we need to really, first of all, just get our head around that is that's the truth. And then we need to go, well, how, how can we change things? It's not out of our hands. It's not part of some thing we can't influence. It's every one of us can make a difference. And I, I think first thing is community. And as you said, um, the, the pandemic, I think, has made people realize that their local community and their local and their neighbors are 
Well, you know, they are the people that you end up relying on, right? When things go bad, uh, they provide you with food, they provide you with backup, they provide you with um, support. And in this case, um, I know personally the many, many people who had tech problems in pandemic. And of course, tech became so important to being able to do your job from home. And the people who ended up helping them were their neighbors mm -hmm. and, and locals. And I think we got to hold on to that. We've really got to hold on to that because that's, that's, that's so valuable. That's, that's wealth. That's proper wealth, right? <laughs> it's actually having neighbors that, you know, that you have a real relationship with. And we have all this great tech. I love tech, but, but not, but, but we also need to have it in balance with the rest of, of environment and society. And we just, it's totally out of balance. So, so Nicholas Prowse is also asking a, a question sort of building out from the COVID experience. Uh, he's asking, so he's saying, excluding higher prices or inflation and global supply chain issues, including COVID related, what do you see as the current bottlenecks in supporting right to repair for the population in terms of materials and supply chain for the UK? So we've all we're a lot more conscious of this thing called supply chain. Um, what, what in terms of right to repair um, might the blockers be? Uh, Amrit, do you want to start with that one? I'd actually argue that right to repair helps with the sort of with the with the issues we have around shipping of, of parts from all over the world. We live in a global economy, but actually being able to repair goods means that we're less reliant on everything that's going on around us if we can sort of do those repairs locally. Um, and so I think, again, borrowing one of Mark's examples from earlier in the day, um, if you, something goes wrong with your washing machine, you don't want to wait three months to get a new one because it's got to come from some far flung part of the world, you, wouldn't you much rather be able to repair it and use it on the same day? Um, so actually I think right to repair helps build in resiliency because we're able to use the things we have to a much greater level and extent than we, are, we would be able to otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. Anything to add to that, Mark? No, I totally agree, Amrit. I mean, I think that um, right to repair is going to make us more resilient um, in terms of supply chains um, and um, you know, because when things are repairable, you know, you can repair, I mean, they're designed to be repaired. And, and you, at the moment, quite a lot of things, there's certain errors where you just have to get a whole new thing. And when, <laughs> if you're having to ship that halfway around the world, as opposed to having to get a small part and there's local repair experience with professionals who can make a living out of it or neighbors who have that skill, you're doing two things there. One is you're, yeah, you're, you're much more likely to get it up and running within a few days rather than a few months. But secondly, you're not outsourcing your CO2 emissions because you're not having a whole new washing machine made in another country and shipped to you. You're actually repairing the one that's in your house or your laptop or your phone with a small part and the money is going into the local economy. Mm -hmm. So the money is going to, and that makes your local economy richer, which means it has more amenities. It has a swimming pool now because there's more people earning money and there's more taxes and therefore you can afford that stuff instead of the money going to another country. So it, it makes sense in so many ways. Yeah, so it's, it's economic, environmental and societal resilience actually. Um, all right, I've got another question from Timothy Lassender from Joburg. Um, can you briefly discuss strategies that may promote design for repairability at the training or higher institution levels. He, he's saying that we largely follow the trend in product design, whereas he thinks that we need to do something more radical around design thinking. And he's asked Amrit for your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So I think, it, I think it's really important from the very, as, as Mark said earlier, it even starts earlier than sort of higher education. It's right from the early days of embedding in the idea that everything has to be sort of thought about every stage of life. It's not just a, a linear model anymore of use, produce, and sorry, produce, use, and throw away. Um, and so I think, you know, I think there's often a misconception that if you're gonna design something which is good for the environment, it's gonna be you know, perhaps not as good looking or aesthetically pleasing as, as a product that is not. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. So you can make fantastic looking products and you know, design things which are people, consumers want, but actually is kind to the environment as well. Um, and so I think that's a that's a key key factor um, and promoting that sort of out, you know, outside the box thinking. It's a bit cliche, but pr promoting the sort of thinking that you can look at things that have been produced in the same way for hundreds of years and do it do it differently uh, is really important. Great. Well, we're starting to get quite tight for time. I'm trying to fling in a couple more questions. Uh, Mark, I'm going to go to you. Kayleen Helms has said. Is there some aspect of motivation, interest, and popularity of DIY for home repairs and remodels that could be applied to other technology devices? 
I mean, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because actually DIY in terms of sort of people um, replumbing their bathroom and, you know, you're doing their own kitchens and all that stuff, that's, that's going great guns. And um, there's this very healthy, you know, economy in that. Um, and so why isn't that translated? I think one of the issues is that there's, you know, the, the objects that we're talking about, like flat screen TVs, um, washing machines, phones, uh, fridges, um, kettles, then then they're not designed to be repaired often or, or they are designed, but it, you, it, you have to have special tools to get into them. And where do you get those tools from? They're not in these DIY places. You have to sort of get them specially. Um, I think iFixit, the website iFixit does a really good job because what they, they not only send you the parts. So if you want to change your battery on your smartphone, that's four years old, they'll not only send you the battery, they'll send you the tools to get in and they'll send, and you, there's a video how to do it. And I think we haven't really mentioned YouTube, but I, I, I honestly, <laughs> we are at this amazing moment where getting information about and step-by-step and -step instructions is now totally done. Like we have this amazing video instructions you can pause and go back, but it's usually the little tiny tools that are the real problem. And as, as anyone out there who knows, is that if you have the right tool for the job, <laughs> the job's easy. Great, Amrit, any last thoughts on that? I, I completely agree with what, what Mark says. I think it's it's so important that the provision of, of the tools is is there, and there are there are other companies looking at this as well and, and how to do it. So, you know, I think keep, let's let's get more of that out there and and uh, help help make the the change that we want to see in the world. Yeah, you feel there's a business opportunity in there. Someone's got to be filling that market niche. Um, so we're coming really close to the end of the session, and I want to give you all a chance to um, end with a, a question that's that's from. Laura James, who is a CTO at Open, and she's asking what one change would each panelist make in the world to drive more repair and end built-in obsolescence? So we've, we've talked far and wide, but if you had to distill it down into one thing that you really think would make the most difference, I would say systemically, what would that be? But also if there's any last advice you want to leave with um, everyone watching, because as you pointed out, Mark, this is up to all of us. We can't wait for someone else to come in and rescue us. Um, very happy to hear your thoughts on that too so a couple of minutes from each of you on those 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 final very large questions please um mark would you like to kick off sure sure i mean i'm going to say the word modularity we didn't talk about it too much so i've got a modular phone as uh, it's by a company called a fair phone and um it's a it, it's a great way to make products modular uh, sorry repairable without it, but but still be a commercial company and still deliver you know excellent you know excellent product and if you look up the Fairphone, you'll see you can change the battery. I get, <laughs> you know, I've got I've got it here. Look, you can, you can actually get into the battery without any tools. Look, I'm just going to take the back off it now. Look, there it is. There's the battery. I can just pop it out. I mean, that and and the camera is modular. The um, touch button is modular, and I can just ask for a spare part. And there's two screws here, and they're normal Phillips screws, and I can just take it out. Now, kettles modular. The only thing that goes on the kettle is a, is the um, switch and the element. Why can't we have modular versions of those? Modular um, toasters already exist. There's many companies that do that. So you can look out to buy them. Our toaster is 20 years old and we just keep replacing the filament. You know, these things, it isn't actually that hard. You can make money. Companies are making money now, but we have to buy them. So it's not just the people have to deliver them and they are doing it like Amrit is doing it. But actually, us citizens have to care enough to go, I am going to look for the repairable option. I'm going to ask about repairability. And, I, and when I find the one that's repairable or modular, I'm going to pay that bit extra because it often does cost a little bit extra at the moment. It won't in the future because it will be normal. But at the moment, it costs a bit extra and pay that. And you are making a difference. Brilliant. No excuses for any of us. Um, Amrit, what would your magic wand yeah. be for us all? I'd, I'd echo Mark, and actually I'd, I would argue for interoperability. So what I mean by that is that you could take parts from different products and, and sort of change them without there sort of being a loss in function. Um, so I could take a battery from a Samsung phone, for example, and stick it into an Apple iPhone, and it shouldn't cause any issue. Now, there's massive changes there that, that would need to be done at a systemic level. So this is a bit sort of pie in the sky, but in an ideal world, that would save so much headache. Because you imagine all of those, instead of every company having to have a warehouse full of 10 years worth of parts that they've been producing, you just have large centralized hubs that have all the parts that go into a product. So if you 
have a, a phone battery and that the battery would be the same for everything. So I think that's sort of more collaboration amongst different companies and sort of building in that interoperability will really drive the secular economy. I also agree with Mark as well. The more voice we can raise to these issues, that's what drives the legislation because then suddenly the, the politicians care about what, what the people care about. Um, again, Mark gave a great example earlier today about sort of plastic waste only really becoming a sort of legislative win on the back of David Ashborough's series. So, you know, once the public cares about it, that's when meaningful change happens. Well, well, Mark and Amrit, thank you so much. You've covered off so many different topics in the space of this short hour. And, um, you know, we started off talking about what a, what a huge and almost overwhelming challenge we're facing, but you've ended on a very empowering note. Um, so thank you so much. I'm sure it's been uh, really interesting for all the people listening. And um, it's been great as well to have so many brilliant questions from our audience. So I'd like to thank our two wonderful speakers and also everyone in the audience who posed questions. Um, in the chat box, you'll see that we've posted a link to a short survey and we'd be grateful if as many of you as possible could complete this because it will help us to ensure that our future events are as relevant and engaging for you all as I hope today has had been. And um, please also do join us for the first in our Ask the Engineers event series, looking at what COP26 should be aiming to achieve which is on the 18th of October at 5 p.m. So we continue the sustainability theme again. But for now, thank you so much to our fabulous speakers. Um, goodbye to all of you. And I hope to see you all again next time.